Welcome to MA3D1, the Warwick Maths module in Fluid Dynamics. And today's topic is Conservation Laws in Continuum Mechanics. Now, what we normally understand as conservation laws, where you identify a quantity which does not change with time, as other dynamics carry on, is uh, generalized. That sort of notion is generalized in fluid mechanics. In fluid mechanics, a conservation law is any sort of relationship, any evolution of a quantity whose, uh, which changes according to the strengths of sources and sinks that you can identify. Okay, So, uh, examples of such quantities would be mass, momentum and angular momentum. These are three quantities that we will consider. But you could also have, uh, well, let me talk about that later. Let me first tell you what we plan to do with these quantities. So what we plan to do is write down rates of changes of all these quantities. And a convenient way of doing that is to consider an abstract quantity, capital B, which could be any one of these three, or a fourth or fifth quantity. Uh, and write its rate of change in terms of its sources and sinks. Now this quantity B is distributed throughout the volume. For example, mass is distributed throughout the volume with a density rho and can be written as the volume integral of this density over that volume. Similarly, e each of these quantities and indeed the abstract quantity capital B can be thought to have a density little b so that the total amount of capital B in a given volume omega can be found by integrating its density little b over that volume. Okay, So this gives us the total amount of capital B in that volume and we want to now also characterize the sources and the sinks. So we say let us consider a volumetric source with uh, represented by the field Q superscript capital B of xt so that uh, the generation rate per unit volume of an infinite sumal element located at x at time t is given by qb and in addition to that we must also consider something called a surface source a surface source is uh, uh, it results from exchanging the quantity b with the neighboring fluid fluid neighboring the volume omega okay so for example oh hang on so let, let's first write the uh, conservation law itself the time rate of change of capital b which is written as this integral uh, must be equal to the rate at which it is generated volumetrically plus the rate at which it is acquired through the surface from its neighbors. As an example, consider uh, the quantity to be momentum. The sources of momentum is any quantity that causes a rate of change of momentum. And this quantity, according to Newton's second law, is the force acting on this volume. Now, this force, one could say, comes from two different types. Of, uh, of sources. So the first could be the weight, just the gravitational pull exerted by Earth on our fluid. The weight is written is you take an infinite sumal mass rho times d omega multiplied by the acceleration due to gravity to find the weight of that infinite sumal mass and you integrate that weight to find the total force of gravitational weight. An example of a surface force is the force exerted by fluid pressure. When we discussed pressure as a fluid quantity, we uh, discussed its application that it can be used to calculate the force exerted by the fluid on a surface. So here we do have a surface. We have a volume omega and it has a surface. It has a boundary delta omega and the surrounding fluid exerts a force proportional to the pressure and in the direction of the unit normal to the surface on our volume. And therefore, you will notice that this has this form of a surface source term. 
and uh, uh, that's the role that the surface role the uh, surface source plays in the conservation law. Now notice that unlike the volumetric source, which only depends on the point that you're talking about and on time, the surface source could also depend additionally on the orientation of the boundary at that point which means if I have one val volume omega and another vo volume let, let me draw it in a different color another volume omega right there the two volumes let's say intersect at this point the unit normal to the red volume is shown in red the unit normal to the blue volume is shown in blue and this is the outward normal even though the physical point the location of the point that we are considering is the same because the surface is oriented differently the surface source term could also be different and you can see that for example in the uh, in this example where the force is derived from pressure which constitutes a source of momentum if the surface normal changes the force of pressure also changes at least it changes direction and therefore an important dependence of the surface source is the orientation of the surface and this dependence is going to be critical in what follows because it is possible to determine what this dependence is explicitly purely through mathematics and uh, and uh, uh, and the use of this conservation law so let's see how that is done in order to do that what we have to con we have to do a thought experiment in this thought experiment we apply this conservation law to a volume like the blue volume that is shown here the volume has an extent L so that its volume is proportional to L cube and what we are now going to consider is to keep the shape of the volume fixed but shrink its size and as we shrink its size its volume the physical volume shrinks as L cubed and therefore the first integral in this equation the rate of change of the quantity B within the volume also shrinks as L cubed well, if the volume is tiny, the amount of quantity B in it will also be tiny. That's the logic behind it. And the amount of tininess is quantified by this L cubed. The volumetric source term is also a volumetric quantity, which means it is proportional to the volume uh, of uh, under consideration. And therefore, it will also shrink to zero as L cubed. But the third term is the surface integral. And is proportional to the surface area of the volume. Now no matter what the shape of this volume is, its surface will shrink to zero as L squared, and which is slower than L cubed. And therefore, the mathematically rigorous way of saying it would be, if you consider the limit as L goes to zero, of one over L squared times this equation, if you take all the terms on the left hand side, then you will note that the first term being proportional to L cube will vanish. The second term proportional to L cube will also vanish and you will be left with just the surface source term. So this result says that for any infinite symbol volume, the surface source must always uh, integrate to zero which means the net contribution from a surface source on any closed surface should vanish. And this is a very puzzling result. What does it mean? Does it mean that our effort put into conserving this quantity B to find its rate of change and to account for the volumetric source is futile? Because the surface, it's only the surface source that contributes in the end and it doesn't even give us a meaningful result. It doesn't tell us how to, for example, solve for the flow. Well, the same puzzle uh, was faced by 
the French mathematician, engineer, and physicist Augustin Louis Cauchy. The same Cauchy as the Cauchy of Cauchy's Integral Theorem for Complex Analysis and so on. And he had an ingenious interpretation of this result, uh, which we are going to discuss next. It's such a pivotal result in continuum mechanics that even if you don't follow the rest of anything in the rest of this chapter, if you just follow this argument by Cauchy, it will be worth uh, your while. So let me now present the argument made by Cauchy with his tetrahedron. The tetrahedron has one inclined face of area A with unit normal and hat, which is shown in red, right here. The other faces of the tetrahedron are constructed by projecting this inclined face on the coordinate planes. Uh, therefore, the components or the sizes of these triangles can, or triangular faces can be related to the size of the size and orientation of the inclined face by this relation which is a vector relation of areas here i uh, is a dummy repeated index so it is summed over or in component form uh, or index notation you can write a n i equals a i where a i is the area of the ith face Cauchy applied the equation that we just derived, the one that is shown in red here, um, to the tetrahedron, to the shape of the tetrahedron. Because the tetrahedron is infinite similar in size, the integrand in this uh, integral does not vary with position. But it only depends on the orientation of the surface. Remember that the surface source term depends on the orientation of the surface. And since the tetrahedron is uh, uh, tetrahedron has only planar faces, uh, even that dependence is a constant. So it's very easy to integrate uh, to write the integral. The integral, in fact, becomes. From the inclined face, we get HB of n hat times A. Now from the YZ, from, from the face in the YZ plane, you get, because the normal to the YZ plane is along the X direction. And similarly, from the XZ plane and the XY plane. Now, noting the principle of exchange, we have this relation, which merely says that the quantity B gained from across the boundary is lost by the volume on the other side. Uh, and then on top of that, noting this relation between the areas of the faces, uh, the expression, the last expression we derive simplifies to HB, sorry, superscript P of n hat equals HB of E j hat n j. Wow, that's a remarkable result. This result means that if the surface source term is known for three orthogonal directions the, along the three ej's then it can be found for any arbitrary direction n hat by taking this sort of combination now let us introduce the customary notation to represent this relation it is customary to say that tb with some indices and then an additional index j is equal to HB of EJ. Here, these additional indices written, denoted by the ellipsis, simply uh, allow for the possibility that HB is also 
has a non uh, non trivial tensorial rank then substituting this notation in the in cauchy's result we have h b of n hat equals t j t b j times n j so you don't need a dot there and this is cauchy's main result next we are going to see how this result cures the dimensional inconsistency of the surface so now let us see how cauchy's result cures the dimensional inconsistency that puzzled us so let, here we have started with uh, the conservation law and the surface source term is now replaced with the result by cauchy uh, we know that this surface term is now written in a form that divergence theorem applies and therefore when we apply to convert the surface integral into a volume integral and examination of the volume integral then confirms that that term now scales as the volume of uh, the element and not as the area anymore which can then match with the other two terms that scaled with the volume so in this manner the dimensional inconsistency is cured we are now ready to uh, arrive at a significant milestone in this module which is the derivation and the expression of the conservation law for uh, a continuum field in this case we have derived the most uh, the general conservation law for some abstract quantity b which we are going to apply to mass momentum and angular momentum later so let's see what the statement of uh, the conservation law is the statement appears in different forms an integral form and also a differential form the in the integral form uh, the conservation law is written in terms of integrals over various quantities and uh, the different forms in which it appears it basically arises from certain decisions that the user has to make whether you apply the divergence theorem to the surface source term and second decision you have to make is whether to apply the Reynolds transport theorem to the left hand side to this term over here the rate of change of the total amount of b inside the volume following the volume so let's say we only apply the reynolds transport theorem then the left hand side is given by these two terms there is one term that comes from the fact that the rate of change of a fixed within a fixed volume not necessarily moving with the fluid and the second term accounts for the error incurred because the volume was held fixed the error comes from the fact that fluid can flow in and out of that volume and carry this property b with it that's that term and this form has two volumetric integrals one is the rate of change of b within the volume and second is the volumetric generation of b again within the volume these two are the volume integrals and in the fixed volume the quantity b can change because it is being generated or because of these two surface integrals which in one way or another carry the quantity b with the fluid or in some other way so these two terms are usually combined into a form into an expression called the flux b times uj minus this uh, surface source object the quant when the quantity b is carried by the fluid that part is called the convective flux or the advective flux and the one that comes from the surface source is usually of a diffusive nature and therefore it is called the diffusive flux but this depends on the situation this form of the this integral form of the conservation law is called the conservative form 
because it explicitly accounts for the fact that the property B gained by the volume through the surface is lost by the neighboring volumes because this flux will cause a loss on the neighboring volumes if it was a gain for this volume. Another form, integral form of expressing the conservation law is if you apply both the divergence theorem and the Reynolds transport theorem. In that case, both these area integrals become volu volume integrals and everything can be combined into a single volume integral, which is how it is written in this expression over here. The advantage of this form is that it is easy to now convert this into a differential form. This is already a, a, an important milestone, so let me uh, tell you in what way. Remember, we started off by saying we want to apply conservation laws to infinitesimal volumes and or arbitrary volumes. And there was a question of, well, how can we apply it to arbitrary volumes if we don't know the shapes or the sizes, etc., of the volume? And here it is. For any volume omega, whether it be finite or infinitesimal, any size, if you have a property B, which is conserved according to the definition we have put together earlier, then the rate of change of B must be balanced by the various generations, the volumetric source term or the surface source term or an expression involving the transport of B by the fluid. Because this holds irrespective of any volume omega, irrespective of the shape of the volume or size of the volume omega, then the only way it can hold for every volume is if the integrand itself is zero, if the integrand itself vanishes identically. And this leads to the differential form of the conservation law, which simply says that the integrand in the second integral form uh, must vanish identically and I have taken the source two source terms on the right hand side and written the conservation law expressing um, uh, expressed in a differential form. So here is the significant milestone the two integral forms and this differential form which appears as equation 2.25 in the notes, uh, now applies the conservation law in a consistent manner to an arbitrary volume of the fluid. That completes the video on the conservation laws in continuum mechanics. I will see you in the next video or in another live session. Um, 